Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It is so wonderful to have you here with us, whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary or joining us virtually. I would like to say a special thank you to the stream team who has been working so hard on um, getting through many different technical difficulties. You'll notice if you're joining us from home this week that we have a new setup. We have a new camera. And if you're here in the sanctuary, you can turn around and we have a new camera on that tripod back there. So we hope this improves our experience and we thank you for those of us joining us at home and online for your patience and understanding as we work through all of these difficulties. It's such a joy to be able to have hybrid worship where we can be both in person and online for whatever works best for us. This morning we get to welcome back with us Pastor David Hindman, who's gonna lead us in worship this morning. And uh, I had word from Pastor Lisa this weekend. She is incredibly grateful uh, for her renewal leave. And she, quote, is looking forward to being back with us this Tuesday, September 7th. So uh, I just wanted to make that announcement. She is coming back. Please extend to her some extra grace and love this week as she is transitioning back into this time. I'm sure everybody has something they want to say to Pastor Lisa, and she's going to look forward to it, but she can't do everything at once. So please, a little bit of extra love and grace for our pastor as she comes back joining us this week. I invite you to fill out a Connect card with us this morning. So if you're joining us here in the sanctuary, you have a physical card, and you can fill out your name and leave it in the offering plate on your way out in the narthex. If you're joining us virtually, there should also be an option for you to fill out the card. And it's so very important because this is the only way that we know that you're here. And with that, I'd also like to remind you that this is a communion Sunday. So if you're joining us from home, I invite you to prepare your elements if you haven't had time to do that yet. If you're here in the sanctuary, I hope you had a chance to grab one of your individual little communion cups. And if you haven't, um, maybe wave your hand and one of the ushers might be able to help you with that. And now I invite you to join me in our call to worship found in the bulletin or written on the screen in front of you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The risen Christ is with us. I invite you to join me in the opening prayer. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to join me and stand as you are able to sing hymn number 616, Come Sinners to the Gospel Feast.
Good morning. Good morning. The scripture readings this morning is from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 and 14 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For it's if a person with gold rings and, and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please. While to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made a distinction among yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not th they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by, all, by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you say to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do, n do not supply their bodily needs, what good is it then? So faith by itself if it has no works, is dead. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning, friends. I'm going to rearrange the communion table because that's what preachers get to do. Because sometimes we want to separate these when they really belong together. I want to tell you that um, if you were talking during the prelude, gosh, you missed a really good prelude. And um, even if the sermon is terrible, at least you got something out of today's service, right? Thank you for sharing your gift with us. And I also want to say what a wonderful gift you have in Laura, who uh, has been so faithful in the three weeks that I've been with you and has led worship with such grace and with such hospitality. Um, sometimes I, I had a preacher friend who said, preachers are paid to be good and lay people are good for nothing. That's not the case. I mean, the blessings, the riches, the gifts that you bring to us, whether you're lay or ordained, is just beautiful. And you have a treasure in Laura and in the folks who are, they promised to make me look good this week. So I think that involves putting a prince's crown on my head and googly eyes, but I'm not sure about that. That's right. And you persevered in reading scripture this week. I hope everybody's been thinking this week that as they've been on social media, they thought, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And like Laura, I want to invite you to be gracious, welcoming, and joyous as you receive your pastor back again. My dad, when he went on vacation, he said, you spend two weeks on vacation, and then you spend the next two weeks trying to figure out how to get out of work. Uh, and I don't think that's going to be the case for Lisa, but in this pandemic environment, what a gift that your preacher actually is going to come back. Because she doesn't have to. And so I hope that you will welcome her, that you will send her a note, send her a text, send her a, 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 an email, um, just to say, we've missed you, we're glad you're our pastor, we are blessed because of you. And like Laura said, don't give her 58,000 things to do that first day. At least wait until Thursday for that, okay? 
What a gift it's been for me to be with you as well. I also want to send you greetings from Ashley Roth, Iser Hagen, who grew up in this church, heard her first call to ministry in this church. When she was at Randolph-Macon, she did an internship with me and lived to tell about it uh, and has moved to a new church, a new uh, a pastor of a new situation for her in this season. That is a daunting, challenging thing. So I invite you to pray for Ashley and her husband, Brett, as well in this season of ministry change for them. So I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine. It was her first time that she was worshiping in this congregation. She was a newlywed. Her husband had been a longtime member of this church. It's her first Sunday at this church. She's sitting in a pew, minding her own business, listening to the beautiful prelude, checking to see if she knows the hymns that are going to be sung. And she looks up, and there's this older lady leaning on her cane, staring at her like she clearly has done something wrong. And so my friend says, good morning. And she gets a good morning response. Am I sitting in your pew? Yes. <laughs> Would you like me to move? Yes. So much for United Methodism's open doors, open minds, open hearts. So how do I know this story? Well, the, 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 the newlywed is a friend of mine, and the old lady leaning on a cane was my mother. <laughs> Fortunately, as Shakespeare says, all's well that ends well. My friend's caring and kind, and not much gets to her, not even my mother. And so over the years, she and my mom eventually became good friends, sat on the same pew, but each in their own respective place. Happy ending. Not always the case. In the late 1700s, there were a couple of um, Methodist lay preachers, Richard Allen in Philadelphia and James Varick in New York City. Their pictures are on the front of your bulletin. They were among black members of predominantly white churches in those two cities, and they were each at one time or another forced to give up their seats for white worshipers, moved, forced to move to the back of the sanctuary or to the balcony. Alan and Varick eventually took their leave of those two congregations where they'd worshiped and in fact had regularly preached. And eventually the two of them helped organize and became bishops of the African Methodist Episcopal Church or the African Methodist Episcopal Zion denomination. You may also know that um, the issue of slavery led white Southern Methodists to split from the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1844 to form the church that I was familiar with, the Methodist Episcopal Church South. That's what the cornerstone said on the church I grew up in. And that church was a church for both owners and slaves. But I don't know whether you got the memo or not, but the South lost the Civil War. And white Southern Methodists simply could not abide being in the same church with their former slaves. And so in 1870 in Tennessee, white Methodists created the then colored Methodist Episcopal Church. Yes, that was the name of it until 1956. The colored Methodist Episcopal Church, former human property to make sure that from then on they would only worship with Jesus's white friends. The AMEs, the AMEZs, and the CMEs today have almost five million members between them. And that's not just ancient history. Think about the letter of James and his words about the rich and the wealthy being shown partiality. A lot of preachers can tell you stories of church members who've made large pledges who assume that they'll get special treatment and have greater influence as they intentionally throw their monetary weight around. And sometimes these divisions, they're not really done on purpose, they just kind of happen. Years ago, I was the pastor of a church in Newport News, and we had a pretty diverse worship attendance, 
on Sunday mornings, about a sixth of our membership or our, our attendees were actually in the nursery. It was a very young congregation with lots of young families, and about a fifth of our congregation were folks who were not white, some of them not even American. And one day, I got this phone call from someone at Williamsburg United Methodist Church, where I now worship. They'd heard our congregation was diverse and young, and they wanted a couple of folks from our church to come to Williamsburg and talk with them about why Williamsburg Church wasn't like that. And I said, friend, I can tell you that over the phone. Because we had church members who had Williamsburg zip codes, but they lived in trailer parks. And when you look at Williamsburg Church, if you've, been, if you've ever been there, it's this large, imposing, impressive colonial structure and located across the street from the college. And that building and the location silently tell folks like my members, you really don't belong here. This is a place for prestige. This is a place for power. You wouldn't fit here. Why don't you go to that little church in Newport News? You'll be a lot happier there. And that's a, a challenge that lots of congregations face. Whether we like it or not, whether it's on purpose or accidental, outsiders can get a sense of who we really are at our core and whether they'll really, really, really be welcome. I remember some years ago when I was at William & Mary as the campus minister, one of my colleagues at the University of Mary Washington told this story that the, the, the ecumenical Christian campus ministry group at Mary Washington had a, a weekly dinner and program and they had invited the student group affiliated with LGBTQ students to come and join them for dinner and conversation. The dinner was going to start at 6 o'clock. As the students came in, they noticed that there was this gaggle of... Uh, students out on the sidewalk who did not come into the space until exactly six o'clock. They had a wonderful dinner, they had good conversation, and eventually one of the students in the campus ministry said to the LBGTQ students, I noticed that y'all were standing out on the sidewalk. Why didn't you come in as you arrived? Why did you come in as a, as a group? And the answer was pretty quick. We didn't know what kind of reception we would get on the other side of the door. We didn't know whether this was really going to be a welcoming group or whether we had been set up by some Christian group who was going to convert us and were really homophobic and not welcoming and truly sympathetic to who we are. From the very beginning, we Christians have been tempted to show partiality, especially to the rich, the influential, or people who look like us. That's why James is so fierce in his criticism when the church shows favoritism. It's not only tacky. It's not only evil. It dishonors the poor. It dishonors those who are on the margins. It also brings shame, as James says, to the excellent name of Christ who comes to us in the weakest and most vulnerable. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew's gospel? Whatever you did to the hungry, whatever you did to the naked, whatever you did to the thirsty, whatever you did to the sick, whatever you did to those in prison, you did it to me. James is calling us to a way that's different from the world's way. When we Christ followers seek to walk in it, in the words of the song from the musical, The Music Man, let me tell you, there can be trouble in River City. Perhaps you've seen a photo of a statue of a homeless person lying on a bench. He's covered in a blanket from head to foot. His feet are exposed, and only upon looking closer do you notice that the feet are pierced. It is a homeless Jesus. And in recent years, at Christmas time, some churches have 
put out their lovely display of Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus out in the yard for people to see. The difference is that they've put a fence around the family or they've put the family into a cage as a reminder that the Holy Family was once a refugee family fleeing for their lives for safety and well-being. Both displays are true to the gospel. But I got to tell you, sometimes there have been a few sparks of controversy (laughs) inside the church and especially outside the church. A homeless person doesn't deserve to be outside the church. Oh, wait, that's Jesus. Excuse me. The gospel at its truest and its best does such things. It creates trouble and controversy. There's an earthier form of this that I heard this week on the TV show uh, Ted Lasso. But in the show, one of the characters quotes Jesus and says, the truth will set you free. And then they follow it up. But first, it's going to tick you off. But until we are free from favoritism, sisters and brothers, we won't ever be free, truly. James asks a gut check question about our commitment to Christ. Do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ? Can't we? We can't have it both ways. When we tell the poor or anyone who counts for nothing in this world that others are more important than they, we insult them and we insult the God who created them and us. We can be so dazzled by the ways of the world that we can be blinded to God's better ways. James writes that this God chooses the poor and blesses them with rich faith. God promises that they surely will be among those who inherit the kingdom and the life coming to those who love God. And then James criticizes and questions the actions of those who are kind of in his target. He fears that their love for the rich and the powerful leaves little or no room for God, to love God, to love the neighbor. And in the end, they may end up being cut out of the only inheritance that matters and short of the only wealth that truly makes us rich. And this is not just James, a verse here, a verse there, throughout Scripture, from the Old Testament Psalms and wisdom and law and prophets, through the gospel stories of Jesus, to the acts of the church, to the letters of Paul and John and James, there is this consistent relentless, unwavering statement of God's commitment to the poor, the weak, the oppressed, the powerless. And there is that steady, relentless, unwavering expectation that God's people, us, will also share and act on that concern. We're not to defer to the rich or the powerful or the privileged, Always we're simply to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly. It's not enough simply to say, you're in my thoughts and prayers. It's not enough to say, well, God bless you. A living and vibrant faith needs to have some meat on it. It needs to have my meat on it. It needs to have our meat on it. James writes, If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, but you don't supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. 
here's the gospel truth. Throughout scripture, we see God's preferential option for the poor. It doesn't mean God loves us any less. It means that if God has to choose, God is going to stand with the poor and the vulnerable in the world because God knows no one else will except God and those committed to God's ways. Again and again, we are provided opportunities to make that same choice, you and I, with the homeless poor, the refugees arriving from Afghanistan or elsewhere, the woman in the local jail or the guy working three jobs to make ends meet or the CNA cleaning up after our loved ones. They're there right in front of us if we have eyes to see. And so here are some steps. The first one is simply move beyond writing a check or making a donation and move outside our comfort zone, move outside our church pews. Second, get to know the poor and their story and experience. You know, whenever, well, not whenever, because I don't always do this, but the times that I have gone into the 7-Eleven to get my coffee or my Slurpee or my Ding Dong or whatever it is that I've gotten that particular day, if I will stop and ask the person on the other side of the counter, what's going on in your life today? They'll tell me. And if I say, especially, what can I pray for you about? I don't think I've ever had a person who said, I'm good. Every one of them had something that we could share. And they valued the fact that somebody actually noticed them as a person and not simply as someone on the other side of the counter. One year, a friend of mine did a sabbatical year. Like, Lisa's only longer. And like, Lisa's only the fact he didn't get paid for that year because it was a year sabbatical. And he took it to recharge his spiritual batteries. And since he didn't have a church job, he worked as a waiter in a local restaurant and rode the bus back and forth each day to work. Now he's a pastor back in Williamsburg and he still rides the bus one day a week in order to sit and watch and meet and hear the stories of the working poor who are riding on the same bus with him. He says, I know that look of exhaustion I know that look of worry on faces, because once it was on my face. I invite all of us to find ways to meet and listen and serve the poor, because they are everywhere, waiting on you at the 7-Eleven or the Mickey D's or the Walmart, or serving our country, or providing child care to children or grandchildren, or tending your lawn or stocking your groceries or standing on the roadside with a sign. John Wesley, God bless his name, John Wesley once said, the reason we do not love the poor is because we do not know the poor. Know them. And God will show us how to love them. When I was a kid growing up, playing pickup ball games at school, Rest assured, I knew exactly where to go and when I was going to be picked. My assignment was going to be right field because I was going to be the last kid picked on the team. The popular kids, the skilled kids, they were the ones who were picked first. Let me tell you, I was not in that group. That's the way the world works, right? The popular kid, the best looking, the most skilled, sure, I want you on my team. Imagine a world where God is choosing sides, where God picks the team. How odd of God to choose the least skilled, the awkward, the clumsy, the poor, the uncertain, the misfit. 
God does love all of us. It's just that God knows what a life-changing and glorious difference can happen when the last and the least and the lost are chosen and cherished. It changes them. It changes us with a richness and an inheritance the world cannot give. Today, on this Lord's Day, we celebrate and embody that good news as we gather at Christ's table. There's room for all of us. And all of us are favored because here in the words of St. Paul, there is neither rich nor poor, male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. There is space for you. There's space for me and for others who need an invitation from us and who need to see God's love through us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Scottish roots were nourished by that. We have prayers that we bring, prayers that God puts on our hearts. I've prepared a prayer, and you have your own. As we go through the prayers, I will uh, give you the guide of God of abundant riches and mercy, and your response will be, hear our prayer. So let us pray, friends. For the poor, the working poor, the unemployed, the underemployed, the disabled who cannot be employed. God of abundant riches and mercy. For the invisible poor who make our life possible but are hidden from our view. Immigrants harvesting our fruit and vegetables. The woman in the food processing plant cutting up our chicken. The immigrant hired to do the job we don't want to do or the dangerous work damaging their health. God of abundant riches and mercy. For the poor we see every day but do not always see. The one stocking our shelves, waiting our table, cleaning our office or classroom, cooking our meal or washing the dishes, cashing us out, cutting our grass, gathering our garbage or recyclables, the guy on the bike riding from one job to the next. God of abundant riches and mercy. For the homeless or ill housed, the senior on social security, the enlisted person on, in barracks, the chronically ill in body or mind, the underinsured overwhelmed by the hospital bill they cannot pay, the person driving to work in their third-hand car on its last wheel or walking two miles to the nearest bus stop. God of abundant riches and mercy. Amen. For the student taking classes and working a job, the high school dropout, the single mom, the 58-year-old laid-off guy too educated to be hired and about to lose his home. God of abundant riches and mercy. For eyes to see and hearts to love and willingness to serve and courage to get them, get to know them and to cherish them in the way you cherish us all. God of abundant riches and mercy. Amen. For others we know who are poor in body, mind, or spirit and need our prayers, our love, and our help, whom we name aloud or silently now. my friend Vicki going through a divorce. God of abundant riches and mercy. We offer these prayers in the name of Christ who came and died and rose again for all our sake. Amen. And on this day we do come or invited to come to the Lord's table to share in a feast with the one who has called us here by grace. So I invite you, if you're at home, to make sure that you have 
the ingredients that you need to share in this feast with us as we extend the table from this place to far places across God's world. I invite you to make sure that you have your individual communion cup. If you don't have that, raise your hand, and I'm sure someone will bring that to you. Seems like the table is set and we are prepared. And I invite you to turn to page 12 in the hymnal to join in the invitation, confession, and pardon. Friends, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And I invite you to turn over to page 15 where you will find the responses for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In ancient days, you created us in your image, inviting us to live as your people upon this earth. When we fell short and acted out of fear and doubt, you held our hand and walked with us out of the garden and into every corner of the earth. When we struggle to love, you blessed us and challenged us to be a blessing to all the nations. You continue to extend the hand of your steadfast love, abiding with us always, even when we turn away. In the words of the prophets, you challenged us to live in love and righteousness, but as we shrunk from the challenge, you sent your son Christ Jesus as love for a love-starved world. From the earliest days of creation to the most recent of days, you offer to abide in us even as we abide in your love. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your constant love. Through Christ's patient love and unfailing grace, we are once again invited into your abiding love and rescued from the fears and sins that would separate us from your nurturing presence. With joy and gratitude, we break this bread of life and we remember the many times when Jesus' love was shared in the breaking of the bread, and in remembrance we take and eat this bread. With awe and wonder, we fill this cup and remember the many times when Jesus poured out his love as an everlasting spring of grace. In remembrance, we will drink from this cup and partake of the love that overflows in our lives. 
with Christ's love in our lives, we are invited to live in your love and to reveal your love to the world, even as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here in person, in spirit, that we may be the branches of Christ, your true vine. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be filled with your abiding love and made to be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Strengthen us in the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may be one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. And with the confidence of the children of God, let us offer the prayer that is always in season. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The bread which we break is a means of sharing in the broken body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a means of sharing in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I invite you, as you are able now, to take your individual serving and open it and take the wafer. This one loaf reminds us of the life of Christ living in us as the body of Christ. This cup reminds us of the love of Christ living through us as the body of Christ. And this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you, take, eat, be filled and satisfied. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Through this sacrament, may we be enriched with faith, hope, and love. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our hymn is number 432. Let us stand as you're able and sing together.
next week you get your pastor back and what a joy that will be. And in the meantime, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, the rich and the poor, the black and the white, Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave or free, all made one in Christ. Amen. Treat them like a sister or brother. Okay, got it. Thank you. Because that's what they are. Okay, got it.